In modern times, one of the most difficult issues leaders are faced with is helping those who struggle with mental health. No longer can we simply encourage a good measure of scripture study and prayer and expect everyone's life to stabilize. This is why Leading Saints felt it was so important to organize the Mentally Healthy Saints Library. There, one can find 25 plus presentations all about ministering to those who struggle with mental health. We cover topics like depression, anxiety, scrupulosity, or OCD. We even cover how to effectively refer individuals to professional therapists and make sure they are getting the help they need. This and so much more. If you'd like to review all of these sessions, we would love to have you do so at no cost. You can visit leadingsaints.org 14 and get access to the full library for 14 days. You'll also receive access to all our virtual libraries where we cover additional leadership related topics. So click the link in the show notes or simply visit leadingsaints.org 14. Dennis Deaton, welcome to the Leading Saints podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Now you are in, did you call it Queens Creek, Arizona? Yeah, singular. Queen Creek. Oh, Queen uh, Creek. Okay. Yeah. It actually is a river, a Queen Creek that comes out of the uh, Globe Superior area of Arizona and comes down into Queen Creek into the valley. So I'm sure it, most people in Arizona know where that's at, but it's basically around the... It's the, we're east of Gilbert and south of Mesa. Nice. Yeah. So is uh, the Gilbert Temple your temple? Yes. In fact, my wife and I are temple workers there, Thursday, third session. Nice. Nice. So, and are you originally from Arizona? No, I was born in Salina, Utah, and I grew up in Salt Lake Valley. I was baptized in the Salt Lake Tabernacle and married in the Salt Lake Temple. Oh, uh, a typical story, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, I wound up, uh, calling Price, Utah, kind of my hometown because that was where, where my wife lived. While I was on my mission, my father got transferred. He was in the highway department. He was made director of highways in southeastern Utah. And I got a letter six months away from my departure date saying my family were moving. My family was moving to, to Price, Utah. And it sounded like, you know, what they talk about in the biblical Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Price, Utah? <laughs> And then nice. it turned out to be a great chapter in our life. And I met my wife the second day that I got to Price and we hit it off right immediately. We both had one of those instant revelations that we were meant for each other. I was thrilled. She was disappointed, but we went on ahead and got married anyway. And, yeah. And yeah. Uh, life went on. That's great. And your story starts out in dentistry as far as your career goes. Yeah. Uh, you know, like there's, there's a lot of good Latter-day Saint boys who, uh, dreamt of, of dentistry and then maybe didn't end up there. So did you expect to have a lifelong career in dentistry? I actually did. Yeah. And I was very happy to be a dentist. I, we had a, a lovely general dentistry practice in Price, Utah. We developed a system of uniting the, the team where we solved problems about days off and vacations and, and raises and so forth. And I actually started doing some training to other dentists about the system that we had. Hmm. But that was sort of driven by something that had happened previous to that. I had just, as I said, I loved dentistry because I, I could work with my hands and I could work with my brain. And I loved the, you know, the study of the human body and the many ways it testifies of Christ and, uh, and its anatomy and functioning and so forth. And I, I was very happy. With, kids were coming along. They're healthy. I was actually in the state presidency at the time. And yet I started getting just the word is restless. Hmm. Something was missing. I couldn't put my finger on what it was. It wasn't about the purpose of life or my testimony. I just uh, was ill at ease. And my wife said, well, why don't you get your patriarchal blessing? See, this is the irony. I'm now a state patriarch, but I didn't get my patriarchal blessing till I was 31. Oh, wow. I grew up in an inactive home. I never even heard of patriarchal blessings in young men's and young women's Back in those days, they never mentioned it. And I never heard of the patriarchal blessing until I got into the mission field. And my uh, companions, most of them had one, and they'd read excerpts from time to time. And it seemed like there were great blessings in there that were based on faithfulness. And I was planning on being faithful, so I didn't know if I needed somebody to tell me to be faithful. <laughs> and like I said, when, the minute I got home from uh, my mission, I met Susan. And 
14 months later, we were married and I got accepted into Washington University Dental School in St. Louis. And we were off to St. Louis four years later. We come you know, back in the practice dentistry into Price and uh, the practice took off and life was good. Um, so I didn't feel like I needed a patriarchal blessing. But when I went and got the blessing in it, it had very little to say about teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but it had quite a bit to say about teaching. It said that I had a gift to teach and that I would develop, I think it says lesson plans that would help people around the world understand gospel principles. Wow. And, and people would see in me a happy person and would want to know more, more about my lifestyle. And so I began thinking about how I could be involved in teaching more. And I volunteered to teach an Old Testament class at 6 a.m. at the Institute at the College of Eastern Utah. Institute director was happy to have somebody take that early morning class, Old Testament. Nobody wanted to come to it. But eventually I saw that this is really what Heavenly Father wanted me to do. Yeah. And I, I had a, an experience really confirmed that after I really got into it, but I don't know if we want to go into all of this history or not. So. Sure, sure. Well, and so did that, what launched you off into sort of the leadership world with, because I, I mean, if, I, if I'm understanding it right, you spent a lot of your career in like leadership consulting. Is that a good way to frame it? Well, it was really in leadership training and yeah. uh, human development training. Okay. The primary premise of our training was this statement, the consummate truth of life is that we alter our destiny by altering our thoughts. Hmm. The mind is our most crucial determinant, our crowning asset, and our ultimate arena of battle. But if we can master the power of our minds, we may do or be whatsoever we will. And that's where I would put it in secular terms. And I would have to put in through the atonement of Christ and with the help of the Spirit, we may do or be whatsoever we will. But yeah. It it really was a message that resonated on all levels for all people. Yeah. It, upper level management needed it. We had them focus on creating a sensory rich emotion laden vision that their people could see and live into. And we started talking about how to deal with change and challenge and adversity. And it all comes back to how you process your experiences in your own thought processes. Yeah. And, and I hope we're, we're going to dig into some of those principles in this discussion. But I'm curious, like, was there a typical clientele that you had, like an industry? Or did you try and teach other dentists to, to start with? Or Yes, we actually started teaching other dentists. And I developed a two-day seminar called Dental Practice with Peace of Mind. Oh, wow. And the first day I taught my dental practice management seminar, the things that I'd been doing in my own practice. And then on the second day, I taught what I called mind management. It was really based on the reading that I had done in the scriptures and also reading the work of William James, the father of modern psychology and Napoleon Hill, hmm. who talked about whatever the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. And when you have a distinctly defined mental image of where you want to go, what you want to do, and you have enough commitment to stay with it, it always comes about. And I believe those principles that because they resonated with the gospel. And what I think that we're really uh, talking about when we talk about faith, we, in fact, uh, one of my favorite passages in Ether is about this great uh, list of significant spiritual experiences that uh, uh, Moroni lists there. And then he talks about the fact that they saw with an eye of faith. And to me, that was talking about the mental imagery we hold in our mind. Well, I couldn't talk about the eye of faith in corporate America without getting some <laughs> feedback on that. And so I came up with the word visioneering. And visioneering is the engineering of dreams into reality through sensory rich, emotion laden imaging. And it's like you actually project yourself forward to such a degree of specificity in reality that's as though it's happening to you presently. It's more than just running mental pictures in your head. It's really running, running mental movies where you put yourself into the movie, where you hear, feel, smell, experience that. And when you are into that state of mind, you start getting ideas coming to you on how to move forward with that. And so then you start getting different times of the day. You'll be sitting in 
the restaurant and somebody will say something, it'll trigger it and you'll grab the napkin to try to jot down this thing that, you know, pertains to your goal. So hmm. those main principles, mind management and visionarying became cornerstones. We didn't try to be everybody's subject matter content experts. We wanted to focus on a couple of subjects and be better than anybody else in, in teaching those. And, yep. uh, and we pretty much did that. We became a multi-million dollar uh, training company. It went through a couple of morphs in naming. We, we, the original name was, I think, uh, probably still the best one. We called ourselves Mind Masters Institute. Hmm. But a lot of corporate people, they would come to the seminar and they would love it. But when they went to turn around and try to get their upper level management to to hire us, it, it, they, they were afraid we were going to show up with uh, ponytails on the side of our head and tambourines <laughs> like Hare Krishna or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to get rid of mind management. And back then, time management and so forth was video. We called ourselves Time Max for a period of time. And we had what we call the Time Max organizer to, to handle the mental clutter so you could really think on what your priorities were about. Yeah. And then that eventually morphed into what we called Cuma Learning. Nice. systems, And that's still our name today. And is, is Cuma like Latin or something? Does it, is it a word that means something? Well, it stands for quality. It's an acronym. So it's oh, okay. quality, Q-U, mental approaches. Oh, gotcha. Awesome. Because, uh, you know, there's one time when quality management was the hot button. And so we kind of fit in that way, quality mental approaches. And again, it is a message that applies to from the rank and file right up to the, the CEO level. Nice. So let's bring this conversation into the context of, you know, this audience is listening, church leaders, you know, this concept of mind management, you know, you, you generally explained it and whatnot. And, and these are familiar, you know, I love Napoleon Hill's work and I've read a lot of it. And, but the, like, how would you introduce it to a group of, of Relief Society presidents or bishops, like on the, a day-to-day, week-to-week leadership experience, how can they leverage the idea of mind management? Well, the way we approach that is we begin by, first of all, when I'm teaching this to in a fireside or as a lesson or, you know, in a youth conference or I've got a, I'm scheduled this weekend to teach at a women's conference in, in Chandler, Arizona. I start off by wanting to know who God is. We have unfortunately inherited a distorted description of our Heavenly Father. We know in the Book of Mormon that there were plain and precious parts taken out of the scriptures. Even before they put together the scripture of the Bible, there were people who were adamantly opposed to depicting God as a father or that Mm. we had a heavenly mother and that our relationship with them would be child to parent and that would be a loving relationship. Augustine, for in particular, wanted to remove any human relatable emotions. They wanted to take that out of the image of God. And then when the reformers got a hold of it, and then the image that has come down and still affects us in the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints here in 2022, is that God is a grumpy old man that's very stern and very judgmental. And if you don't catch him on a good day, you're not likely to get your prayers answered. Mm, So true. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the first thing that I want to get across, again, is to emphasize, we've all heard it. So many times that that God loves us. Nobody has said it better than Elder Jeffrey R. Holland when he talks about the first great commandment being we are to love God with all our might, mind, and strength. But the first great truth of the universe is that God loves us with our all our might, mind, and strength. Once we get that, then we can start having more confidence in a relationship relationship with our Heavenly Father that's going to be loving and constant. Our earthly fathers, most of them, don't just show up, you know, every once in a blue moon. They're with us frequently. They're constantly with us. And I think that there's a statement that's been bandied around that's probably the most, it's 180 degrees wrong, and it's the the devil's in the details. Hmm. It's just the opposite. Our Heavenly Father is with us constantly. And as the more I've experienced life and I've started recognizing just even simple little conversations and simple experiences that are not coincidental. He's working with us all the time. I had one, I had one this, this morning, today, Tuesday, my wife and I have a scheduled pickleball exercise session with the <laughs> former 
president of the Gilbert Temple, Alan and Brenda McClure, they've got a pickleball court and they talked us into pickleball and we kind of got hooked on it. And we normally go, there's a little section in our ward where there's these miniature farms and there's a wonderful family there, uh, the Pines, and they raise some amazing sheep. They're an exotic type of wool and we normally pick up our eggs from them. We like their fresh eggs from them on Monday. But for some reason or other, today we're coming home from the pickleball experience and we stop off at the Pines. And they say, oh, come on back uh, in our backyard. The lambing season has started. And so they've got 12 or 15, 20 ewes. And most of them now are really now delivering their their lambs and were uh, taken to this little area where there's two little two stalls and there's a, a mother a you there that just had given birth to a, a lamb that morning and the one next to it was in the process of labor and there was a spirit that it was just palpable right there it had that same holy feeling like i'd experienced when i witnessed the birth of my children and felt around Susan when she was giving birth. And I thought, this is, Heavenly Father is not just interested in his children, he's interested in all of his creations. And his spirit was there, I believe, coaching those ewes, you're going to be fine. He has a relationship even with the animals of his creation. And I, I just, as I was driving home from that experience, I thought, if we'd have gone over on Monday and just picked up the eggs in the afternoon, we would not have had that experience. That was not a coincidence. Heavenly Father wanted me to feel, and maybe even wanted me to share it at this podcast, that he wants a relationship with all of us. So where is his messages coming to us? And how do they come to us? We all have our, our own independent thinker of thoughts. We have the ability to choose our thoughts. We have the amazing ability that we can step out of our thinking to look back into our thinking, to look at where that thinking is going to take us. And if we don't like that destination, we can come back to this point at the origin and we can change the source and therefore change the destination. And so Heavenly Father, in the process of thinking, he's always uh, pressing upon our minds righteous thoughts. We talk about the still small voice, the voice of the spirit, and they're all real and we've all experienced them, but we don't experience them in the external world. We don't experience them really in our stomach or even our chest, although we talk about our heart being the source of our of our uh, emotions, but we experience those impressions in our minds. And when we are quick to obey them and when we hearken to them, we get confirmation sooner or later that what we thought and what we acted on had come from a, a divine source. But the kicker is, is that we also have an adversary and we are not alone in our thoughts in that we also have, in addition to the voice of the spirit, we have the interjections, the meddlings of our adversary, who is definitely our enemy. He has no love for us and he is constantly putting thoughts in our mind. And one of the biggest things that I want to people to appreciate, especially uh, leaders, of other Latter-day Saints is they've got to help all of the Latter-day Saints recognize the preponderance, the prevalence of those satanic thoughts. Almost every one of us can immediately recognize when we're being urged to commit a major sin, to lie, commit adultery. Those, there's no question that we, when we feel those kind of thoughts in our mind, that we know that they're of Satan and, and we, we override them by and large. But he has the ability to interject in our minds thoughts constantly that are far more insidiously disguised that they masquerade as our own thoughts. And anything that be, belittles our own self-worth, that tears down our relationship, the idea that we're worthy to, enough to pray to our Heavenly Father, any doubts that come into our mind about our own abilities, any thoughts that come into our mind about that are unkind feelings towards others. As we start harboring resentments, those are being fostered, prompted uh, by 
uh, the adversary. And so we are sort of in the middle. We have the right to think our own thoughts, but we are always the chooser. I have had an opportunity to meet a lot of people that have faced some uh, huge adversities, and I've learned a lot from them. And most of them talk about that when they've gone through something debilitating, like a, an accident in which they've been paralyzed, that they, their immediate reaction was, why me? And they, there was a urging, a tendency to go into, this is not fair. They start even having feelings of being angry with God. And those thoughts are being suggested, implemented, promoted by, by the adversary. And those that really override that come to the conclusion that, yes, I could feel better. Yes, I could be angry with God, but that's go only going to increase the damage that this injury did to my life. Mm -hmm. And they therefore sort of come to the point where I'm going to accept this. Some of them really get power out of the idea that maybe I even agreed in pre-mortal life to experience something like this because I wanted to develop greater faith in my Heavenly Father. I wanted to develop the characteristics and perfections of my Savior. And so maybe I signed up for this course. I have a deaf son, born profoundly deaf, and we've had some medical miracles in our life. And there was, after one of them in particular, we just felt like we could have had the, the power to, to have Christian have his hearing. And we fasted and prayed about it, and he in particular, and he came back and said, no, I chose this. This mm -hmm. is what I'm going to learn from. And when we have the feeling that we have a loving relational God that's working with us, that none of these things are accidents or bad luck, then we can start moving to a point of faith. We're saying, what can I learn from this? What are you trying to teach me? And we can go with a, a open, more of an open heart you, uh, and humility to receive then these promptings from the Spirit that will help us to see what we're to learn. And we can have that grace under pressure and ability to override even dramatic, abrupt, seemingly unfair changes in our lives. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, obviously, we're constantly framing things and trying to understand things through our thoughts and perspectives. And, you know, our, our, our mind is constantly working to define things. Is it, and as you've talked about, just recognizing the power of our mind and how it influences us and, and how we think and whatnot. And then similar to just as far as having those open, having an open mindset and a positive mindset towards life that leads us into deeper faith and understanding of what we're experiencing. Yes. And, and we need to understand how responsible we are for the, the states of mind that we live in. Mm. Often in, a, in my seminars, both in, in uh, the church or in my profession, I, will, I tell the story of two contrasting people who were paralyzed in the, in, the in the 11th thoracic vertebra at a young age. And I explained that one went through a grieving process, saturated her pillow with tears many nights, but then she came to the realization that the best thing was for her to accept the situation and go on. And she became really a heroic example of, of courage. And, and I'm not the only one that thinks that. And then I also contrast that with a, a person in the same town with the same background who had a similar accident and is about one of the most bitter, upset people that I know. And so then I'll ask the group, what is making the telling difference in the outcomes? The events that they experience are essentially the same, but how things are turning out is entirely different. What is making the essential difference between this life and the other? And almost immediately, for whatever reason, in business settings, I get almost a choral answer of attitude. It's their attitude. Uh, I guess they've been to a lot of Zig Ziglar seminars or, <laughs> or speeches. Yeah. And I love that answer because then I'll get to say, there's no question that that's an accurate answer. Our attitudes are huge drivers. They lie at the core, they, they influence how we experience our experiences and how we respond to them. But attitude is not quite the bottom line. And why is that? And sooner or later, will somebody will say, because you have a choice, you can choose an attitude. And I love that answer. I said, yes. You know, none of us were born with a fixed chip in our brain that says, you know, you've got a positive attitude and somebody else doesn't. 
we go through changes in attitude at the drop of a hat. And so when, once I can get them people to see that it, uh, uh, attitude is a choice, then I get to hit the, the bottom line. Yeah. If an attitude is a choice, then there must be a chooser. And the chooser is the thinker in, of thoughts inside you. You call it your mind. You can call it the intelligence of your spirit, your soul, or whatever you want to call it. You are in charge of the states of mind that you dwell in. I'll even push the envelope in a secular seminar. So we're even in charge of the duration and intensity of our temptations. Hmm. And one of the things I want to put across in the podcast, and I guess it's coming right now, is I want every person to know that to receive a temptation is not make you unclean in your mind. If I could have just known that when I was a neurotic priesthood boy, I would have just saved <laughs> right. me so much agony. You know, as the hormones yeah. are hitting, I'm driving down in the street on my riding on my bicycle, and I'm thinking about baseball. And out of the blue comes an impure thought into my mind. And I thought, you know, I, I knew I'd heard in neurotic priesthood the week before that I was going to be judged by the th those thoughts. And I thought, oh no, I, I didn't even, you know, wasn't trying to think it. It just came, and so I thought that was my thought. But it wasn't. It was this imposition, this interjection by Lucifer. So we all receive those kinds of impressions, urges to find fault with somebody else, yeah. urges to hold a grudge and so forth. But then the chooser can choose what to do with that. So in the case of a temptation, I can be saying to myself, I've got a goal. I want to cut back on sugars. I don't sleep well. I'm more susceptible to colds and flus when I have a lot of sugar in my body, and I've got a lot of things on my schedule. I can't afford to get sick. I'm going to be laying off the sugars. Well, that won't stop. The next time I'm driving down the street, I pass a Dairy Queen billboard. <laughs> You've all seen it. It's got three Sundays on it. One's got chocolate running down the side of this soft, creamy, swirled ice cream, and one's got caramel, and one's got strawberries. And the minute that hits, I can't stop that image from hitting my mind and my mind processing that, oh, that's a really good looking luscious dessert. But if that moment I can just intercept that thought and say, I'm not going there. I'm going, I'm committed to this goal. I'm cutting back on sugars. And I start running in my mind all the reasons why I want to avoid the sugar. The temptation is essentially over and I'm onto something else. If, however, I pause and I linger. And I actually start visualizing that I've got a spoon in my hand and it's going into that soft, creamy white, the swirly ice cream. And I can actually feel the cold, delicious flavor going down my throat. I've now just increased the duration intensity of my, of my temptation. And so, you know, quoting Neil A. Maxwell, which when was, uh, one of his statements kind of triggered me to, to kind of elaborate on that thought as he says, we set our own thermostat for temptations. And mm. I think we can see how we have control if we choose to exercise it. So let me ask you, as far as the, you know, obviously, you know, going back to when someone goes through a traumatic time, maybe an accident and um, they're paralyzed. And, you know, as far as from the leadership standpoint, like how can we lead people when we can see that their mind management is maybe off, right? Because we can stand in front of them and say, you know, just think differently, you know, don't, change your attitude, you know, do this, do that. Or, or if they're struggling with sin, like, well, just think differently, you know, and, and like, what, what advice would you give for leaders who are trying to help individuals understand their, their mind management and then, you know, actually use that tool in, in effective ways? Okay. Great question. First of all, I want to, as a bishop, as a leader, I first of all want to let everybody know that if they're down, they feel sad, they feel continually unworthy, that they're kind of passing the normal test. Hmm. And it's okay to feel down, disconsolate, unhappy from time to time. We're to taste the bitter from the sweet. But I also would, you know, encourage leaders to think of themselves as teachers. I love a statement by Spencer W. Kimball. It inspired me when I heard it. When he said it, he said, you, you will not have found a great leader until you have found a great teacher. And whenever we have an opportunity to work with our saints, we want to be thinking ourselves, you know, I always thought, well, you know, you want to give counsel, but I would want to switch that over to, no, Dennis, you need to be a teacher. And so I would 
I would want to empathize with them. I want them to make them feel that the way they feel is fine and there's nothing wrong with it. And I probably wouldn't jump right in. I just want to empathize and, and again, go back to emphasize that Heavenly Father will be with you and you want to turn to him in prayer and seek his comfort and guidance. But as I start build, building a relationship where I can be a little bit more direct, I'd want them to, to get the idea that some ideas that are coming to their mind that are producing the outcomes of sadness and prolonged feelings of unworthiness and uh, fear, worry, and doubt can be coming from an outside source, that it's not your thought, but it's one that you're entertaining. And you can think about another thought. Uh, a new feeling is one, one thought away. And, you know, again, work with that in, uh, in a patient way to help them kind of get to the point where they can see, again, that they can create a new outlook on something, that they can dwell, um, choose to dwell on a different version of the story that they hear in their in their heads that's coming from their adversary. Yeah. And I even encourage them to kind of look for the fact that that thought might not even be originating from you. I want people to be able to personify the source of the negative thought that is this uh, liar from the beginning, this enemy we call Luc Lucifer or Satan. I had a mission president called him Old Scratch, and I call him SCAM, S-K-A-M. It's an acronym for the skeptic against me. It's the guy that's always telling me when I go to set a goal that I can't do it and people will laugh at me. So I call him, <laughs> yeah. I call him SCAM, okay? So I want them to be able to detect this voice. There came an experience in my life that was truly life-changing. I came across a book that I never thought I would need or read, and it was called Life Without Ed by Jenny Schaefer and Tom Rutledge. Jenny Schaefer was a woman who had recovered from eating disorder. And the way she did that was from the coaching from Tom Rutledge, where he encouraged her to personify this malevolent, controlling voice that was in her mind, and they called him Ed. ED. And she began to work with that idea and started recognizing how coercive, how rigid and, and really evil this voice uh, was. And, and when she would uh, sort of allow Ed to take control, Tom would ask her, now, is that you speaking or is that Ed speaking? And she began to eventually be able to distinguish the difference between her own voice and this this negative evil voice that was wanting her to restrict and uh, follow his orders. So once you can begin to detect that these and recognize that this is an outside source, then you can disagree with it. And then eventually you can sort of turn the tables and deny it or defeat it by kind of turning the tables. So when you're dealing with fear or worry or doubt or just, you know, you feel this oppressive, negative spirit uh, dwelling in your mind. You want to, to, first of all, personify the source of that. And then you want to listen to that and counter it. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to do a 180 degree re uh, reversal. To give you a, an example of that is, you know, a lot of times, uh, especially my youth, when I'd get up in the morning on Sunday, I would think, well, if, you know, is I don't know if I really want to go to church. I never recognized the idea that the spook might be telling me to, that I didn't want to go to church. But today, in these days, when I get that feeling, you don't go to church, I, oh, you don't want me to go to church. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm not only going to church, I'm going to go to church. <laughs> I'm going to look for some people who are down and out and feel like they might need an arm to be put around them. And when I put my arm around them, I'm going to look in the eye until I really am glad to see them. And when I ask them how they am, I'm going to pay attention to it. I want to care about what they're saying. I want to make a difference there. If there's a, an opportunity to answer a question in Sunday school class or bear my testimony, I want to seize that opportunity. If in priesthood meeting, they ask for volunteers for a, a, a service project, I want to raise my hand. I'm going to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. 
And yeah, and what I think is, you know, he, he's all about making us miserable. And if I can just reverse his shallow little attempt to keep me from going to church and yeah. reverse it on him, I think it makes him miserable. And at the very least, I feel like I, I feel a lot better because yeah. when I see, and this is thank goodness for Lehi's description in the Book of Mormon about everything has its opposite and that righteousness by definition is being enticed to do evil and not going there. And every time we're enticed to do evil, even small things like not go to church and we overcome that, we build spiritual moral muscle. And I like to teach that when I'm counseling or when I'm working with people to help them see that all these things do you have a, a negative feelings towards a neighbor? And you probably have the idea in your head that the last thing you want to do is go over and kind of mend that bridge or find out if they even have negative feelings towards you. But the spook will tell you, don't do that. They don't deserve it. You shouldn't forgive. Well, you, that, that's telling you that that's exactly what you want to do. And when you do it, even if the person didn't have any hard feelings, it was only you had them and you confess and say, I'm sorry, I felt offended by something you said, but I just want you to know that that's, I'm past that and I want to be close to you and I want to be a good friend. You'll walk away from that experience with an endowment of spirit. Yeah. They'll let you know that you overcame Lucifer and you hearken to the voice of the spirit and you're more righteous. Yeah. You know, and this, this concept of personifying, you know, the adversary is is so crucial. And it's easy to hear it and say like, yeah, we, you know, we have a belief that there's an adversary and on and on. We know he's there or whatnot. But we oftentimes in these, as we face life, as we're struggling through life, we frame things like oh, I'm experiencing a lot of adversity or today's a bad day or, you know, this is a mental health concern or on and on. And, on. and those things, I'm not saying that that's not true, but we also have to recognize there is a aggressive force against our eternal progression And when we frame it and put it into that category, we can then begin to push back harder than it's pushing towards us, right? If if it's just this not this nuanced force out there, you know, that's the yeah, Satan isn't happy with us, but whatever, you know. But we have to recognize it as we are in a spiritual battlefield. This is spiritual warfare, and we have to push against that and turn to God, right? Right. And he here's his 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 most diabolical ploy. He loves to interject a thought and he does it so softly, so subtly, it masquerades or we perceive it to be our own thought. And then immediately he will berate us for having thought that thought. Mm -hmm. And he loves to get us to beat ourselves up. Yeah, that's the shame. Anything we do, we fall short. How many of you have not given a talk or a lesson? That oh, yeah. when you when you afterwards you have all these thoughts about the things you could have said and how badly you said what you you, you did say, <laughs> yep. and you have all of this uh, noise going on in your head to try, I guess try to get you to not never to accept a speaking or lesson assignment again, but it's that that responsibility that we take unnecessarily that's the most tragic thing for me. People who are down on themselves. Are, they'll, they'll sometimes blame it on negative self-talk, and yeah. they're two-thirds right. Yeah. It's definitely negative, and it's also talk, but it's not self-talk. It's the talk that's coming from the, the enemy of their soul. And so when they can really grab onto that, then they no longer have to feel guilty about feeling guilty. And prolonged guilt is actually from Satan. Guilt that, that moves us to repentance can be of the of the spirit, but they don't have to carry this self-deprecating and self-limiting these self-limiting beliefs around as though that they were their own thoughts. Yeah, that's really helpful. So tell me about this concept. And you've recently written a book called "Look Into Christ in Every Thought: Defeating Fear, Doubt, and Discouragement." So put it in the context of that scripture. You know, I think it's you reference in Doctrine and Covenants six, right? That like, what is that? Like, how would you frame that or unpack, you know, turning or looking unto Christ in every thought? Okay. I love that question. People will even say to me when, when, when I'm, you know, teaching a, a business seminar, I'll say that there's four laws of the mind and that is mind must think. It's a constant state of activity. It can think of anything. 
but you can, uh, the third law that is that you only thinks of one thing at a time. And people will say, well, how can I look to Christ in every thought and still pay attention when I'm driving, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, or doing a math problem? I believe that it, the Lord there is talking about our overall orientation, the choose ye this day whom you shall serve, the scripture in Joshua, that the overall commitment we have, our purpose in life, is to love our Heavenly Father with all our heart, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. And then, as we're going through the day, that we're kind of praying ourselves through the day. And when you do have, you know, you're overtaken by a negative thought. What I like to do is, whether I, and I can be doing that even while I'm driving. In fact, you know, I've even found a lot of times when I'm having a great day and things are going well, out of the blue will come into my mind, a negative thought about some uh, stupid thing that I said, an embarrassing moment. And uh, one time I just thought it was the random functions of my memory, but I never had a random thought of something that I did good or did well come into my mind. It was always something negative. And then I started realizing that that's the spook just trying to ruin a perfectly good day. But what I I really want them uh, to feel, all of us to feel, that at any moment, I can simply go to my Heavenly Father and say, Heavenly Father, I'm being assailed right now by the adversary. He's wanting me to go here. And I'll almost kind of repeat back to the Lord what, and he already knows what it is, but I repeat it to him. And I'll simply just say, help me to get that out of my mind. Help me to go on. And, uh, you know, just those one sentence quick prayers is something that can happen during the day. I see a, a lot of times uh, bone weary fathers coming home at the end of the day, having fought battles, or this is a bit of you know can be brothers or sisters. We're all breadwinners in in one form or another, and we'll see ourselves worn to a frazzle. Mothers who've been stay at home mothers that have been battling, you know the you know kids that are sick and out of sorts and so forth, and. You know, they're, they're in the back of their mind saying, when am I going to get a chance to just sit down and take a deep breath, let alone be able to say a prayer or read some scriptures? I like them to turn their thoughts when they're in that situation. And especially at the end of the day, when they're just, we're all worn out from our daily grind and feeling like, uh, you know, I, we didn't do anything, quote unquote, spiritual. I want them to turn their thoughts to Matthew 25. If you've done it under the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. And if you're bone weary and tired from serving your children or making a living or going about all your activities and avocations, down deep, you want to feel how great it feels to be that tired in the service of the Lord. Because if you can see that essentially you were serving your family, you were serving your child that's, you know, sick and, and, uh, you spend all day nursing the child as well as trying to get a few things done around the house. That as far as Christ is concerned, it is your, it's like you've done it unto him. And I, whenever I'll go there, this idea that this day was a waste, I didn't get anything, you know, quote, unquote, positive done. My internal world will shift and I'll sort of go to the other thing. Heavenly Father, thank you for accepting that offering was my intent to serve you today. And I guess I did. And I appreciate the opportunity to be of service, even when it's hard and distracting and there's other things I'd like to do. I think that we need to be as constant in our communication back with our Heavenly Father during the course of the day as He is with us. Yeah, that's powerful. That helps us to be turning our thoughts to Christ. We, you know, turning into Christ in every thought. Now, with fear, doubt, and discouragement, I'd, I'd like to actually talk about those in specific. Yeah, let's do it. Fear. Fear is a tool of the devil. I could cite uh, five different statements from apostles and prophets in modern times that say that, that exact statement. And it's in, an interesting in, interjection or in meddling by the adversary because it usually comes with a physical component to it. Physiologically, we feel something hit our bodies at the same time this fearful thought comes into our mind. 
to me, when I would dwell on those kind of thoughts, it almost would feel like uh, somebody was taking duct tape and going around my body and just my, it's like binding my arms to the side of my body. I, th- I was feeling restricted and almost paralyzed. That emotion and that state of mind and body is what I think Satan uses to prevent us from acting on possibilities. The higher the dream, the higher the possibility, the more he'll start saying, oh, you're kidding yourself. You have no business. I mean, you're a dentist. Why do you think you can teach any <laughs> corporate CEOs? You never even worked in a corporation. How do you think you're going to sell any of that to to these uh, hard-bodied uh, seasonal veterans of in the corporate uh, battlefields? But as I would start thinking about the reason for that emotion, it was to prevent me from going forward with it. Uh, There'd be times when I would have a seminar that would come to her three months in advance. And if there was a lot riding on it, there was, you know, it was an important client or a new client where there'd be a lot of possibilities with it. I would start having these fear episodes just showing up intensely and the closer we got to it, and it, there would be times when I thought, well, maybe I could get sick or maybe, the, you know, they'll call it off. And it was just a ridiculous thought because then that shift fear from going to the teach the seminar would be replaced by the fear of not being able to feed my family. So I just kind of stay with it. But what would always happen? And, and then the, especially the night before the seminar, very little sleep, tossing and turning, agonizing over all these thoughts about how. I was going to flop and fail and be ridiculed and laughed at. When I'd actually get to the seminar and say good morning and start into the seminar, those fears would evaporate and I'd feel the spirit. And almost inevitably, the seminar would go very well and people would come up afterwards and talk about the impact that it had onto them. And then as I'd be driving to the airport, I'd be kind of beating myself up. Like, Why did I put myself through all that agony about, uh, you know, this these pre uh, seminar jitters. And this is before I really got on the idea myself that those were coming from the adversary. And so there came a point actually after one of those episodes where in driving the airport, I remember I'd given the seminar in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and was driving to the Denver airport. I just let it loose at the top of my lungs. I just yelled at the adversary <laughs> that I was done with this, that I was not going to put myself through that and I would, uh, made a uh, commitment to him that every time I felt those kind of pangs or pre-seminar jitters, what I was going to do is I was going to be going to my father in prayer. I could be asking for more revelation. I'd put more effort into my preparations and I would make sure that I was ready and prepared no matter what he tried to do. And you know what? There are still sometimes I get butterflies, but I know what to do with them. And I'm not saying that we'll ever be totally free of fear or discouragement or any of these other things. And we don't want to be. Because again, going back to the doctrine of Lehi, that every time we overcome those, we're building righteousness. And so as long as we're in this tabernacle of flesh, we're going to have these these injections of uh, satanic thoughts. So fear is to prevent us from starting or going into it. But then if we get going on to, uh, into it, then the other end of the spectrum is discouragement. Mm. If we, He'll try to stop us. And if we have a f- failure or something doesn't go well and we maybe sometime actually do fall flat in a seminar or something like that, then the voice will start up that, you know, you're kidding yourself. And the words that follow all of that is, and you ought to quit. So you've got two ends of the spectrum. Fear is trying to prevent you from starting and discouragement is trying to get you to quit. And the way you defeat discouragement, and this will sound like the most simplistic answer, but it's the right one. You just don't quit. You persist. You keep praying for strength. You pray for revelation and guidance. You pray for to know what to do, and then you do it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it. And the payoff when you succeed is the greatest and when you have overcome a lot of discouragement, a lot of fear, worry, and doubt, and it's proportionate. The greater the onslaught of the adversary, the greater the reward spiritually, emotionally, when you overcome it, when you succeed. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I hope, uh, Dennis, you don't walk away from this uh, interview with any uh, discouragement or doubt. So <laughs> <laughs> you've, been do- you've done a great job and 
These are awesome principles. I want to ask a just a few questions about your experience as, as a patriarch, if you'd be open to it. And But is there any other concept or around mind management that we need to put a bow on before we, we wrap up? Well, if you're wanting to tie it into the role of a patriarch, I would say this. Whenever you pray, you want to uh, have your iPad or your a pad and pencil by your side. When you ask for guidance, when you ask for help, when you ask Heavenly Father simply, Father, guide me through this day, uh, lead me to be of service to someone. Is there someone right now that I should know about, think about? And then you just pause and listen. And if you get an impression, write it down. If you have a doctrinal question, express it to Heavenly Father and then say, Heavenly Father, help me to know where to go to find an answer. Or what do I need to know about this? And listen. The biggest thing that I did learn in my corporate training that I think prepared me to be a patriarch was when I would be challenged by a significant request for a new seminar or a new line, you know, when we'd kind of hit a home run, they'd say, well, what else do you teach? We have a problem with this. Can you take that on? And I always got used to saying, yes, we can take that on when I had no idea what we'd be doing. (laughs) But when I would go to my heavenly father and say, heavenly father, they want a seminar on innovative thinking. Where do I go? What principles do I need to know? And I would just start reading and searching. And lo and behold, a book would find me. Or somebody would refer me to a a podcast or something like that, where uh, suddenly it would just be a lot of lights going off that this was an answer to what I'd been praying about. And so I learned to pray and write down the the impressions that would come to me and then follow them. And when when you follow them, you find them almost inevitably to to lead you to a a successful experience. So the most, in, in many ways, the most important part of the patriarchal blessing is to know for a surety the tribal lineage that is to be designated. And there are times when uh, the next person is up on the queue for the next appointment that I'm praying about going to the temple for, where that's, you know, the question, first and foremost, I want Heavenly Father's guidance about. Sometimes it comes quickly and sometimes it doesn't. And But it always comes. And there are some times when I'm not absolutely 100% sure when I put my hands on their head. But as the, the words start flowing to me, and it's, uh, it's not dramatic, but it's you, you know that these thoughts that are flowing to you are not your own. They're coming from the Lord. You just articulate them as best you can. There are some times that when you're trying to put them in English, the words that you're saying at that moment, you know, are not exactly matching the impression you got. But when you edit the blessing, you can go back. And the editing process is often just as spiritual as the preparation and the actual blessing itself. But you you just learn to know what it feels like when the Lord is pouring intelligence giving you the answers, answering the prayer, giving you the guidance, or feeding you the elements of the patriarchal blessing that that person needs to receive. Yeah, that's powerful. Love that. So if, if people listening, if they want to uh, dive more into these concepts that you've, you've talked about, I assume this book, Looking Under Christ and Every Thought, is maybe a good place to go. Yeah, lookingunderchrist.com. <laughs> it's in... Uh, ebook. It's an audible. Uh, if you didn't like my voice today, you probably don't want to order the audible book because it's <laughs> nice. in my own voice. And there's three different book forms. There's a hardback. There's a softback that has expanded margins. If you're like me, I like to be writing into books as I read. And there's on Amazon, you can get a six by nine that doesn't have uh, expanded margins. And there you can get a Kindle book and an audible book there as well. Awesome. Well, Dennis, uh, as you reflect on your time as a leader, you know, not just in formal callings uh, like you're serving in now, but uh, just being a leader of some of these thoughts and concepts and how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? It's helped me to know how much he loves us and how much he is guiding the unfolding restoration before us. He is a relational God. He loves us. He's with us all the time in our thoughts. If we hearken unto those, we will be filled with the light of Christ. I think we'll be guided to avoid a lot of danger 
and the turmoil that's, uh, you know, rampant in the world in our day. And I know that he lives. And I'm grateful to have any calling in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because I know Joseph saw the Father and the Son. That concludes this episode of the Leading Saints podcast. We'd love to hear from you about your questions or thoughts or comments. You can either leave a comment on the uh, post related to this episode at leadingsaints.org or go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and send us your perspective or questions. If there's other episodes or topics you'd like to hear on the Leading Saints podcast, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact and share with us the information there. And we would love for you to share this with Any individual you think this would apply to, especially maybe individuals in your ward council or other leaders that you may know who would really appreciate the perspectives that we discussed. And remember, to review the Mentally Healthy Saints Library, click the link in the show notes or go to leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.